Welkom allemaal. Welkom bij dit vierde mini-college in de tweede serie Dit hebben we in huis. Georganiseerd door de faculteit Geesteswetenschappen van de Universiteit van Amsterdam en SPUI 25. Vandaag hebben we uh, als spreekster professor Nancy Adler. Ze zal haar lezing in het Engels geven, maar de vragen kunt u stellen in het Engels of in het Nederlands. Gebruik daarvoor de Q&A-knop onderaan het scherm. Nancy Adler is een American historian. She is a professor in, the his in history and transnational justice. She occupies a chair uh, at the University of Amsterdam in the history department in, co in cooperation with the NIOT, the uh, Institute for uh, War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies. At the NIOT, she's also doing research. She's actually the director of genocide studies at that institute. And uh, she um, combines her job at the NIOT and uh, the University of Amsterdam. She, she studied German languages and literature and Soviet studies at Barnard College, uh, Columbia University. And she did her MA studies uh, in European studies and uh, Russian at the University of Amsterdam, where she also did her PhD research and her postdoc work. Her PhD thesis was on the Gulag, on the survivors of the Gulag and the Soviet system. And she teaches classes uh, at this moment at a master program of the Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And she supervises, of course, PhDs and postdocs. She has published a number of books and many articles and uh, chapters in books. Uh, mainly in the domain of transnational, transitional, sorry, justice, the gulag, the Soviet system, uh, the legacy of communism, but also on oral history and memory. She's a very broad uh, scientist. She is also a member of a number of academic advisory boards, among others, the advisory board of the Simon Wiesenthal Institute in Vienna. And of course, she's also doing uh, academic work for uh, academic journals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And she uh, she participates in uh, the, uh, the the public debate. You may have read her recent article in the Parole uh, of January the 30th uh, on the Nationale Holocaust Herdenking. Today, uh, she will speak on a different subject, which is the future of the Soviet past. And she asked, can uh, doing history further reconciliation in Russia? Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you for this uh, uh, complete and very generous introduction. Uh, bear with me for a moment while I start my PowerPoint. Um, so today I would like to answer uh, the question of what the prospects are for reconciliation when the state denies, marginalizes, or appropriates narrative regarding a history of repression. In conjunction with the end of the Soviet era, both observers and gulag survivors expected that the nation's history of repression would be more fully acknowledged and redressed. By 2005, it was apparent that we were wrong. 15 years ago, I published this article in Europe Asia Studies. At that time, I concluded that it was perhaps too early or too late to confront the Stalinist past. What I did not anticipate then was the stubborn continuity of this trend. Now, 30 years after the end of a 70-year dictatorship that claimed millions of victims, aside from symbolic reparations, the post-Soviet governments have implemented little to none of the accepted institutionalized transitional justice mechanisms to reckon with this past. It was not until 2015 that the state approved the plan for an official monument to the victims of Stalinism. Most of them did not live to see it erected. Revisiting my interviews in the mid 1990s with Gulag returnees, they conjectured that it would take a generation for real changes to occur in the mentality and long political tradition that suppressed the dignity of the individual. 
their hope and expectation was that the first graders of 1996, who were now in their 20s, would be able to fully confront the Stalinist past. Indeed, at exactly that time, the new generation in South Africa was termed born free. But that was after that nation completed a wrenching process of self-judgment. Post-Soviet Russia did not undergo such a process. In consequence, long after the formal demise of the communist regime, the trend to manage national and public memory by repressing, controlling, or even co-opting the memory of repression gained momentum. It has earned post-Soviet Russia the distinction among post-dictatorial, post-conflict, post-genocide societies of a non-case of transitional justice. So this talk today will be informed by my fieldwork in the 1990s, 2000s, and recent years. I will examine some of the causes, courses, and consequences of post-Soviet Russia's ambivalent attitude toward its Stalinist past, and show how this eventuated in some respects in a Putin-era re-Stalinization. While efforts have been made to investigate and publicize a counter-history to the state-sponsored narratives, they have had difficulty finding resonance. So in the rest of this talk today, I will explain why and I will look at the following. Uh, and I will also reflect on how to move beyond current impasses. So let's turn to officially remembering victims of Stalinism. Juggling mixed messages, in October of 2017 in Moscow, President Putin unveiled the Wall of Grief, a monument dedicated to the victims of Stalinism. It was not until 2015, nearly 60 years after Khrushchev raised the prospect and, 20, and 25 years after the NGO Memorial acted on it with its monument on Lubyanka Square, that the state approved this monument. Had the victims lived to witness Putin's unveiling, this would be the message they were given. This plaque marks the entrance of the wall of grief. Note the history lesson here. That there were victims is undeniable. Khrushchev opened that door and Gorbachev made it impossible to shut. But what this sign does not say speaks volumes on Russia's inability, unwillingness, or limitations in confronting the Stalinist past. It is formulated largely agentless, as if a catastrophe hit. The inscription references the victims of repression, but makes no reference to the cause of the repression, nor the identity of the repressors. It does not state that Russia's 20th century leaders did this to their own people. In fact, that could be bypassed as the message busies itself with funding and donations, and largely credits Putin and his government for their efforts. Putin's speech at the monument's opening ceremony didn't mention Stalin by name. He spoke vaguely of the tragedy, terrible past, cruel blow, and dark events that should never be forgotten or justified. Such circumspect references frame these dark events as some sort of disaster that hit the country rather than a deliberate Soviet policy targeting its own population. So here you see Putin standing next, next to Patriarch Kirill. The Russian Orthodox Church has been a good ally for the Kremlin because of their politically safe focus on the martyrs. The government allows the immortalization of the victims to a point, but it draws a rather thick line when it comes to the discussion of the perpetrators. Putin said here that we should mourn the victims, but not bring the country to renewed confrontation by quote, settling scores. Rather than acknowledging and redressing a history of human rights abuses, there's a persistent politically driven effort to repress and manipulate the memory of repression as suggested by the inscription. Such reconceptualization of the past has served as a short-term remedy to circumvent any obligation for Russia to undertake transitional justice. 
One of the small countercurrents to subvert official attempts to ignore or co-opt the history of repression is this last address campaign. It's quite similar to the Stolpersteine with victims, uh, names, professions, dates of arrest, and dates of execution. Um, despite the thousands of ex executed Moscovites, there are still more than uh, there are still no more than three hundred of these plaques hanging on buildings in Moscow, and each represents a renewed struggle with the authorities. This time, just for permission to hang them in light of complaints from resistant residents and others who consider this message to be an unwelcome reminder. At the end of the Khrushchev era, at a different time in history and in a different political context, the public's response to the continual revelations and reminders of the repression was aptly characterized as enough already about 1937. And it was on that note that de-Stalinization was to end for decades. One might argue that in some parts of society today, there is renewed fatigue, if not aversion, to revisiting the crimes of the past regime. And this trend is regularly evidenced. This is another countercurrent. It's a name reading campaign of NKVD execution lists. Every year at the end of October, on the day of political prisoners, the organization Memorial organizes a name reading ceremony to publicly remember the tens of thousands of apolitical undesirables who were shot in the back of the neck on the day of sentencing and dumped in a Moscow grave on the out, a, a grave on the outskirts of Moscow. This is a, a poster for this campaign. I've attended a few times, and these were the names uh, given to me uh, to read in 2011. Each year, the organization struggles for permission to publicly remember these few thousands of the millions of victims. And each year, they encounter renewed obstacles to gaining permission. This is a little bit more recent. The commemoration takes place at this monument to victims of totalitarianism. It's, I mentioned it in the beginning, it's a stone from the Solovetsky Islands, which was the first labor camp under Lenin erected by the organization Memorial in 1990, and it's right across from uh, the notorious Lubyanka, the KGB building. The last time I was at this ceremony a few years ago, a woman who had just finished reciting her family's names walked past me and Arseniy Raginsky, chairman of Memorial, and she turned around and said to him, quote, there should be an international tribunal. This past year, another participant said, Quote, we will not forget and we will not forgive. Even though civil society initiatives are not regularly successful in vying for attention in the public space, the current regime has not stifled the memory of repression. At present, in addition to the wall of grief, there is a well-funded, impressive Moscow city-sponsored Gulag Museum. The museum provides a professional permanent display and rich public programming to expose the Stalinist past. Uh, this is a new exhibition. Uh, these are actual prison doors that were retrieved from the far reaches of the Gulag Empire by museum staff. The museum benefits from state funding, which may influence the viewpoint of the narratives. Thus, while it accurately recognizes the violation of human rights that was the modus operandi within the Gulag, it avoids emphasizing that repression was likewise the modus operandi of Soviet rule. Nor does its critical appraisal extend to present human rights violations, though by inference, one can consider the implications. The select narrative of the past is supported by and conveyed through publications, films, school curricula, and legislation. And it's also reinforced from the bottom up with the support of the Orthodox Church and the emergent cult surrounding the Soviet victory and the great, in the Great Patriarch, Patriotic War. So let's turn to the rehabilitation of Stalin. Reassessments of Stalin and his repression since his death in 1953 have pivoted from vilification to rehabilitation. He has done well in the opinion polls lately. 
Apparently, the industrialization and the wartime victory were more relevant to those polled than the millions of victims that can be traced back in part to the very same accomplishments. Stalin's popularity, according to the Levada Center, a very respectable polling agency, recently reached a historical record since their polling began in the early 2000s. And here it says that 70% uh, of the Russians consider Stalin's role in history to be positive. This trend may be partly driven by nostalgia for the stability of the Soviet era, triggered by the traumatic experience of the immediate post-Soviet years, when the, when the citizens of a free Russia had expected prosperity, but instead found themselves faced with privatization, price deregulation, poverty, corruption, and chaos. In consequence, while in 2005, a portrait of Stalin on a trolleybus in St. Petersburg caused an uproar, by 2015, his image on cars, advertising boards, and posters no longer provoked outrage. So alongside with official measures that criminalized pro-Stalin propaganda, the parallel process of rehabilitation of Stalin continues on buses, in monuments, in stores, in textbooks, and in the public space. During that 10 year interim, so from 2005 to 2015, the growing valorization of Stalin was accompanied by the growing acceptance of repression. His rise in popularity was supported by a sequence of cultural and legal measures. They included the restoration of an ode to Stalin engraved in a Moscow metro station and the establishment of a state commission to guard against the quote, falsification of history to the detriment of Russia's interests. Had Stalin and Stalinism been formally judged after the collapse of the Soviet Union, any related glorification or commercialization would have been proscribed. Such an opportunity might have presented itself at the 1992 trial to determine the constitutionality of the ban on the Communist Party. In a 1998 interview I did with Sergei Kavalyov, former dissident and human rights commissioner under Yeltsin, he suggested that this hearing could have been a Russian Nuremberg on the crimes of communism. It would have exposed the malfeasance of the system itself and discredited it. Two such precedents are provided by post-Nazi Germany and post-apartheid South Africa. Nuremberg was imposed from without, the South African Commission from within. And in Kavalyov's scenario, Russia would have been judging itself, a reckoning that failed then and largely fails now. It never ended up getting beyond the issue at hand and decidedly did not address Stalin's crimes head on. So let's move to the battle of contested memories. The history of the state's mass murder and terrorization of its own citizens runs counter to the mythologized Soviet victory over the barbaric Nazi regime. And that's a counterstone, uh, of, sorry, a cornerstone of the state-generated narrative. The war is cleansed of numerous gray zones and reframed into a story of exceptional heroism displayed by the Soviet people. Here's a reenactment at a subway station in Moscow. And this was an actual train in a subway station in Moscow a few years ago. In August of 2019, on the 80th anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the Russian government spun a narrative that praised this move as a feat of Soviet diplomacy as, quote, the only strategically possible step. Despite, however, the Russian government's conflict of interest regarding the Stalinist past, it passed a bill in 2015 on the remembrance of victims of political repression. It supported memorialization, books of remembrance, databases, archival access, victim recognition, and victim compensation. And it further endorsed the erection of the monument I showed you in the beginning and the Gulag Museum. But along with these measures, the state supported practical patriotism without defining it, but it had a Stalinist orientation. 
civil society is thus chronically tasked with comparing the government's words with their deeds. At present, the work of historians and civil society actors who challenge the official narrative of present or past events has become more marginalized and in some cases, clearly even dangerous. Memorial, and I've already mentioned it a few times, has been accused of political activities and targeted for official harassment for not having declared themselves foreign agent in keeping with a 2012 law. Here's a headquarters in 2013, it says foreign agent loves USA. So at the very time the state was endorsing remembrance initiatives, it was charging this organization and many others with supporting foreign interests because they received foreign donations. And these are uh, 32,000 pages that were confiscated from headquarters in 2016. It appears that such state-sponsored measures could severely limit the functioning of this human rights watchdog, which emerged during Gorbachev's perestroika. And that's a fact I'll get back to in just a minute. In the last few years, the organization has been increasingly threatened with liquidation. This wouldn't be all that hard. As its late chair told me, quote, the authorities could also just kill us with fines. In our last interview, he no longer characterized the state's obstacles to its work as battles. Rather, he diagnosed their opposition as a, quote, chronic condition. Roginsky's pessimism was prescient, not just about the future of Memorial, but about the deterioration of intellectual and academic freedom in Russia. In 2019, the Ministry of Education circulated a protocol to scholarly institutions circumscribing their contact with visiting foreigners. It suggested that a minimum of two Russian scholars be present at every meeting with foreigners. The last time I witnessed this phenomenon, was in my student days in the 1980s. Let's turn to memory battle, uh, battlegrounds. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't go into the 2014 destruction of the labor camp perm. It was a fairly known story. But perm was just an early casualty in the memory battleground. Another widely publicized case involved the 2016 arrest and subsequent incarceration of Yuri Dmitriev, director of the Karelian branch of Memorial. He was charged with child pornography allegedly found on his home computer. He had brought unwanted attention to himself through his work on the mass grave sites of the Stalinist era, notably in the Sandarmor forest near the Finnish border, where an estimated 9,000 victims lay buried in communal pits. Dmitriev helped discover and identify the bodies of over 6,000 victims. During these investigations, it became clear that these findings did not comfortably fit with the narrative advocated by the Russian government and bolstered by the state-sponsored Military Historical Society. Since 2015, in their counter-investigation of the same killing ground, they claimed that the victims were Soviet POWs executed during the war by the Finnish army that had occupied this territory from 1941 to 1944. In 2020, Dmitriev was sentenced to 13 years in a strict regime prison colony. Turning to national memory and the national narrative or state-generated history. Many Soviet leaders were concerned about de-Stalinization and they imposed limitations accordingly. During dissertation research in the 1990s, I gained access to a document of Politburo proceedings from November 1988, in which the agenda item Memorial was up for discussion. Gorbachev was apprehensive about the political potential of the organization, and he wanted to limit Memorial to the regional level under party supervision. He feared its mandate, and that was 30 years ago. Creeping Stalinization, as it has been increasingly termed, casts a long shadow over Russia. This phenomenon has taken on all kinds of forms, as in the case of the British-French movie, The Death of Stalin, which some of you may have seen. Two days before its scheduled release in Russia in 2018, the Ministry of Culture suspended its license. It was problematic because of its genre, which was satire. 
Had it not been for such a strong reaction, the film would have likely gone largely unnoticed. A B-movie of limited historical value. Uh, Radio Liberty ran the headline, Stalin's death canceled. The reasoning given by top Russian officials for banning the film was that it was extremist. A group of lawyers insinuated that the film that the film's creators intended to, quote, falsify our country's past so that the life of the Soviet people during the 1950s would only invoke dread and aversion. Turning now to curriculum, the reforms a government imposes on curricula are clear indicators of what it wants students to learn about and from the past. Now, I should say that in practice, teachers still feel free to more or less disregard the content of the official textbooks and the documents on patriotic education. This was a rather well-known manual in 2009. The approved account of history taught in Russian high schools today is a sanitized version of the Stalinist past. Putin has argued that Russia should not be made to feel guilty about the great purge of 1937 because, quote, in other countries, even worse things happened. Since 2012, the Russian government has been making extra efforts to strengthen its control over history. Putin began his third presidential term in what was officially pronounced the year of history in Russia. Top level meetings were convened to develop uniform policies on history making. Among the particular faults examined were the quote, tendentious description of the Soviet period of Russian history as an uninterrupted sequence of mistakes and crimes committed by the state against its people, unquote. They were concerned about belittling the, quote, decisive contribution of the USSR to the defeat of Nazi Germany and equal poising Nazism and Stalinism. While Putin may have long been in the background of the history lesson discussion, this changed on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the victory in the Great P Patriotic War last year. On that date, Putin stepped out of his mostly supporting role and now donned the mantle of historian himself. He launched a 9,000 word polemic on the history of the Second World War. His narrative legitimized the repression as the necessary cost of the state that defeated Hitler. Putin called attention to Russia's bright past and noted, in passing, some dark pages. Now I'll briefly turn to the non-state sponsored narrative. Despite the state's strong influence on how the story of the past should be told, independent scholarly and cultural initiatives have gained some resonance. One such is the Free Historian Society. It calls for a deeper history supplemented by mining the oral history and memories that have been passed on by families and through generations. Other bottom-up initiatives aimed at a broader and younger audience include a blog by Denis Karagodin, grandson of a Stalin era victim, and I'll get to him um, in my conclusion, an oral history initiative called Generation Gulag, and the chronicle of 32-year-old Yuri Dud, a Russian YouTuber with 5 million followers, whose 2019 film uh, went viral. So please bear with me for a moment so I can uh, share something else with you. And also, please have patience with the technical moment I may experience with this film. На улице минус 55, и это Колыма. Очень красивый и очень суровый край со страшным прошлым и сложным настоящим. Долгие годы Колыма была цитаделью сталинских репрессий. Одного из самых чудовищных периодов в русской истории. Через эти места прошло около миллиона заключенных. При этом многие из них никаких преступлений не совершали. Десятки тысяч из них не вернулись отсюда домой. Сотни тысяч вернулись, но с переломанными здоровьем и жизнью. Заключенные ГУЛАГа добывали здесь золото, олово, уран и другие важные ресурсы. Они же построили трассу Колыма протяженностью 2000 километров, одну из самых сложных и опасных трасс России. По трассе Колыма мы и едем 
из Магадана в Якутск. По дороге мы общаемся с людьми, которые здесь живут. У выпуска, который вы сейчас посмотрите, есть две задачи. Первое — кому-то рассказать, а кому-то напомнить, какой ужас пережила наша страна. Вторая — показать, что на планете есть места, которые, кажутся не приспособлены для жизни. Но даже в этих местах человек может адаптироваться, жить и быть счастливым. Надеюсь... Uh, I'm back, but I'm afraid I have to find where I was. So bear with me for just a moment. Okay. Allow me in closing to again cite uh, two important friends and mentors who passed away in the last few years. Um, they were the conscience of two cohorts of Soviet prisoners. Simeon Vilensky was incensed by the fact that there had never been a moral condemnation Of the Soviet uh, of the Communist Party. He was head of a victim's organization, Vazdrashenia, a Kalima survivor, a memoir publisher. And he asserted that Russia would benefit from a Nuremberg trial without blood. He ventured that those found guilty of these crimes against humanity could receive the maximum penalty and then be pardoned. Vilensky was one of the last remaining survivors of the Stalinist era. Until the end of his life in 2016, he called for the state to recognize and repent. Arseniy Raginsky's passing in 2017 signaled the end of a different era. Raginsky, I've mentioned him many times now, memorial chair and founder, uh, ex-prisoner of the dissident era, argued that identifying victims is only the first step in dealing with their oppression. He said, quote, the memory of Stalinism in Russia is almost always the memory of victims. Victims, not crimes. Unlike the Nazis, we mainly killed our own people and our consciousness refused to accept this fact. According to Raginsky, identifying the oppressors, many still unnamed, would be the next step toward remediating the past and improving the future. One such example is a memorial publication on the executioners at uh, Katyn, uh, the, the massacre of thousands of Polish officers uh, by Stalin's NKVD. Uh, this publication exposes the fact that they received official commendations for their brutal deeds. Another is the investigative work of Denis Karagodin, great-grandson of the peasant Stepan Karagodin, who was executed in 1938. Denis Karagodin meticulously researched Uh, and reconstructed his great-grandfather's execution, and he dedicated a blog to this case. This is a medium that may offer considerable outreach to Russian youth. This is the generation carrying the hopes disclosed by the Gulag returnees I interviewed in the late 80s. Encouragement for their hopes is exemplified by the apology tendered by the granddaughter of one of the perpetrators. She added that her family had also suffered during Stalin's terror. The fact that these second generation descendants engaged in an act of mutual commiseration may augur well for the prospects of transitional justice in Russia. According to a Soviet aphorism, it was easy to talk about the present and future, but the past keeps changing every day. So to return to my initial question on what are the prospects for reconciliation when the state denies or co-opts the narrative regarding a history of repression. I recently completed an edited volume with my colleague Anton Weisvent. It's coming out uh, by Indiana University Press uh, this, this fall. The project took three years. What happened even in the course of preparing this collection of contributions by Russian and Western scholars for publication indicates perhaps in microcosm the fragile ground on which critical investigation of the Soviet past still rests. The European University at St. Petersburg, one of the author's home institutions, was nearly put out of commission by the authorities. Another Russian scholar who was writing an essay for the collection had to withdraw her contribution due to the pressure exercised by her university administration. Another was denied an entry visa to Russia. Another, had long been living in self-imposed exile in the West. 
And our author from Memorial belongs to an organization locked in a perennial struggle for its right to exist. There are, however, conceivable and constructive ways to move forward from the not so bright past to a brighter future. An inclusive history that recognizes the victims and their heirs while it verifies, analyzes, records, acknowledges, and seeks to understand the competing narratives of the Soviet past could facilitate a shift from dueling monologues to engaging dialogues. And this might offer a future agenda on which society and the state could work in unison, or at least alongside each other. Historians would bear a special responsibility in this process. Such a common undertaking might move Russia, however fragilely, beyond the post-communist impasse and shorten the long shadow of repression. In the absence of such an effort, the future of the Soviet past is predictable. And I hope I'm back. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much, Nancy, for this very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, we've got already a, a number of, uh, of questions, so let's start right away. But uh, listeners may still uh, ask questions in the Q&A uh, box. Um, two of the questions were concerned with Solzhenitsyn, the author. So they wonder whether, uh, you know, how uh, particularly among young generations nowadays, is, is his work still uh, read? Do, do they discuss his ideas? Um, so questions about Solzhenitsyn. Could you elaborate a bit on that to start with? Uh, certainly. Um well, it was uh, a very important moment when uh, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago actually appeared in Russia, in Russian and in Russia. Uh, and that was, I think, right around 1990. In 2010, there was an initiative actually uh, orchestrated by Putin to have uh, Solzhenitsyn be part of the curriculum in high schools. And, and that's very important. However, uh, Solzhenitsyn, um, his works were used in uh, literature and not in history classes. And that already says something about the genre in which these works were seen. But Solzhenitsyn uh, was a very important force in exposing, uh, well, exposing the horrors of, of life in the camps. And, uh, um, one more point that I think was very important that Solzhenitsyn made about uh, the beginning of, let's say, coming to terms with the past since, since that's what my lecture was on. In 1956, when um, sort of liberation commissions were going to the camps and interviewing prisoners, uh, Solzhenitsyn made a comment to the extent, to the effect of, uh, shouldn't these commissions uh, be dropping to their knees and asking for our we prisoners forgiveness instead of just looking at the charges and saying, okay, you're exonerated, you can go. So Solzhenitsyn raised some very important questions and he is part of the curriculum, but again, it's, um, um, it was a strategic move uh, and not putting that in the history classes is, is another um, important um, question that we have to ask ourselves. Thank you very much. Another question is about the role of the Orthodox Church in this. What could be their role? Uh, yeah, also a very good question. Um, their role is very good in that they are certainly uh, making victims very important uh, and also uh, the mass burial grounds uh, that are that are often in, in some of the sacred areas where the churches are, they are um, they are make, making those sites of museums and so forth. They also are fairly good allies with the government. So keeping, let's say, the, the victims of Stalinism on the agenda and on the political agenda is important, and it's an important role. But once again. Uh, it's fairly safe because they're giving a narrative that allows victims to be considered martyrs. 
Uh, and if a victim is a martyr, you really don't have to get into the question of who or what was responsible for their victimization. So it's a, it's a, I would say a, um, a convenient um, uh, ally and uh, who actually should, should uh, be disturbed by the fact that victims are getting so much attention from the church. Okay. Thank you. Well, someone else uh, is saying, how is the fact that executioners could turn quite easily into victims, complicating a potential reconciliation? Yeah, uh, in general, a very, uh, a very complex question uh, in, in all uh, post-dictatorial societies. Um, the one of the very few measures that was taken toward actual uh, confronting the past and transitional justice was so-called rehabilitation. And there were laws uh, made on rehabilitation as soon as uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, well, starting around 1990. And if you had been uh, incarcerated or executed for something that, that you didn't do, then your family would be able to request rehabilitation and you would, you would be able to get a few privileges. Um, uh, the, the, the privileges are paltry, but you would still get this status. What they did not anticipate, the authorities did not anticipate, is that the families of some of the uh, executioners like Beria, uh, who was Stalin's, uh, let's say, one of his chief henchmen, the family applied for rehabilitation. Why? Because Beria was executed as an English spy. He did a lot of horrible things, but he was not an English spy. So in fact, uh, he, he was tried and executed for crimes that he did not commit. So um, they, they deemed that that category, those who were part of the terror machine, could not be eligible for rehabilitation, but there were lots. There was lots of gray zone in between, and so that that discussion. I mean, there were many, many victims in Soviet society, and and those who rose in the ranks uh, could also, in in some respects, be called victims. There, there. We've talked about uh, uh, the little zone being the camps, but the big zone being Soviet society itself. So there are some, some clearly black and white distinctions, and there are a lot of very complex categories in between because so many people were implicated by the nature of the system. Okay, and uh, another question, are you hopeful that there will be a change of attitude in the near future? Um, well, hope would be something I, I would like to be, um, and uh, I think that there are really some some important initiatives going on. I I, I spent a little time uh, on them at the end. Uh, yes. There are a number of youth uh, who who are getting involved in, uh, let's say, oral history projects, and and uh, there is some raising of awareness. Um, but the near future. I don't quite think so. Uh, the generation that has passed, actually the opposite has happened in the generation. We really did think something different would happen in this generation. So uh, I think um, among other things, it's going to take more time for the culture of repression in the former Soviet Union to allow for uh, more broad ranging practices that would move it in, in the direction, well, that I've been discussing in this talk today. Hey, and, and could you, what, uh, another question here, what current or recent case of transitional, transitional justice in another country or other countries could serve as an example for Russia, for the Soviet Union? Um, I think, I think that there are no one-on-one -on -one cases uh, because it's very much, there, there is no one size fits all. Uh, but I've been involved in a very interesting a project called Legacies of Dehumanization uh, with Russian researchers and with uh, Stellenbosch University in South Africa and with uh, the Free University in Amsterdam, thinking about ways to approach how people conceptualize stories, how they process uh, uh, the experience of having been through the gulag or the camps or, or prisons. Um, I. I think um, I think 
actually some of the things that I was talking about um, at the end, or at least I listed in the end, a forensic examination, uh, gathering personal testimonies, legal testimony would be a different story. I do not think any type of trial issue would, would work. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I really think more in terms of something along the line of a historical commission and truth commission not state sponsored, but, but, but something bringing, bringing, well, I hope historians will have a bigger role in this task actually, that to, to provide some invisible linkages. Well, then there is someone who says Stalin's stump is still in the center of Moscow. It needs to be removed. Do you agree? <laughs> it's not just that it's still in the center of Moscow. There, there are, hundreds, if not thousands of, of monuments to Stalin. Some of them have been erected just in the last few years. I showed one of them from 2015. Mm -hmm. um, Yevgeny Yevtushenko uh, wrote a poem in the Khrushchev era on the front pages of Pravda during de-Stalinization, where he said, okay, we've removed Stalin from Lenin's tomb, but how to remove Stalin from Stalin's heirs? This is uh, this is a question that still has to be answered decades later, um, uh, because Stalin is very much, of course, associated with a victory in the Great Patriotic War, and that's a very important cause, uh, of course. And uh, there's also the industrialization and the eradication of illiteracy and many, um, many important achievements of the Soviet past are directly associated with Stalin's reign. Uh, and there's a tendency, at least right now, to want to focus on the bright past instead of the dark pages that happened as a result of those very same practices at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Well, then someone with more questions more related to, to Putin, so to say, and there's a question about, uh, can you explain why Yeltsin selected, of all people, a KGB agent to succeed him? Uh... It's a very good question, and and I really I really can't. I, I it's 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 something I would have to do some some thinking about. Um, I also don't think uh, we anticipated that Putin would would be, let's say, such an authoritarian ruler, despite his his past. I mean, there there we are. Uh, uh, when he came in, we were years past the collapse of the Soviet Union, and now we're 30 years past the collapse of the Soviet Union. This authoritarianism light, um, the trends may have been observed, but nobody nobody expected that. And, and Yeltsin certainly did not expect that. Someone even asks, can today's Putin's policy be called a new level of genocide against Russia's people? Uh, <laughs> That's a that's a very uh, provocative uh, question. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say um, it, it's a very interesting question, but I I would say no. Um, and I I also um, I also don't consider uh, Stalin's crimes to fit into the category of genocide. It makes it makes them no less egregious because it was mass political uh, uh, mass. Uh, political repression and at, at the cost of millions of lives. And uh, even if the camps were sur survivable, there was also uh, quite often a calculation that no one would return. But no, I, I my answer would have to be no to that question. Okay. Um, let's see. We've already... Um... Why is the given topic important to discuss in a non-Russian context? Um, I guess we could talk about it as global citizens. Um, and uh, since the global ascent of the human rights discourse, we, we tend to think that the way a country treats its citizens is everyone's business. So there's a delicate balance. Uh, we certainly uh, shouldn't be telling another country what to do, but there have been many, many cases where, uh, where uh, from genocide, dictatorship, uh, state terror, where the successor governments have approached the past. And uh, in this case, there really has been such a, um, such a reversal of any processes that were nascent. Uh, I think that we, uh, we should keep our 
eyes on that again as human beings. Yeah, and did, did you uh, did your studies uh, on the Soviet Union? Uh, did they did it change your view of our own way uh, of the, the Dutch way to uh, remember our undesirable past, so to say? Um, I guess that uh, watching it from up close, from let's say my my perch uh, as as a uh, researcher at Niod, um there are a lot of good examples. I think uh, the Netherlands can set on this on this front, and so I, I think I've been inspired by all the different ways of remembering and confronting the past, and most recently. Uh, the decolonization efforts and coming to terms with a, which with much uh, uh, with historical injustices that were much further in the past has something to offer to uh, to our perspective and shaping what might work for for countries um, countries uh, uh, such as Russia, which is a rather unique case. Sorry, I was muted. A final question here. Um, Ho Chi Minh's legacy in Vietnam is very unopposed despite some of the horrible crimes that took place in the Indochina wars and beyond. He also has a legacy of victory and lit literacy. Does that indicate little hope for Russia, for the Soviet Union? <laughs> um it's a little bit of the same phenomenon. Yeah, and, yeah. And also, also Mao. Uh, there, there is something about uh, um, certain societies and certain figures in history uh, when uh, it's very hard to eradicate the culture of repression. I mean, that's 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 sort of the first point. So, so um, there, there is no, there's no easy remedy for that. I think that. I think that um, a, let's say an accurate history, uh, really, really trying to uh, get to the bottom of the dynamics of repression in that particular society might offer some important lessons learned so that we wouldn't be having uh, Ho Chi Minh, Stalin statues, Mao statues, but it's, uh, it's a very tall order. Um, and it's, a, it's the same, I, I, I often, um, tell my students who may be here today, uh, Nuremberg is still a work in progress and we have to kind of look at it over a longer run. So this is, this is Stalin may have died in 1953, but the Soviet Union only collapsed in 1990. So timing is an important issue. And obviously uh, um, uh, it's going to take more time for us to approach a different, a different level of confronting the past there. Okay, well, Nancy, I think this is a good moment to thank you very much for uh, this very interesting discussion after a very interesting lecture. I think uh, we all uh, enjoyed it very much. And uh, thank you for all the, all the great questions and moderating. Okay, thank you. And next week, uh, we will have Professor Irene Zwiep, and she will talk about Kennis maakt naakt over bogen en mensen in het paradijs. So I hope to see many of you uh, again uh, next week. Thank you all. Oh.